This is the More to the Story podcast with Dr. Andy Miller. We hope you guys enjoyed today's conversation. Now, my regular listeners might see the title of this episode as being something that's just for preachers. And certainly, the content is something that I've used in my preaching class, but I think it's something that's helpful for everybody. I remember sitting with a business leader in the Tampa community, some a member of our board, Mr. Tao Lan, who's a CPA. He was a partner with a major big five financial firm. And as I was sitting down with him, he was coaching me up as we were about to head into some intense negotiations. And I realized that in that moment, he was describing to me, he was trying to coaching me on how to use illustrations. Now, he didn't use those words, but basically he was like, when you get in that negotiation, here's the words that you say at this point. This is going to help us drive it home and they'll have to answer in this way. What I realized is he was giving me a preaching lesson. So on today's episode and next week's episode as well. So for two episodes, we're going to look at illustrations or what Alice McKenzie calls, and you'll hear that in today's podcast, illustrative energy. How do we bring this type of energy into our conversations? And those of you who sit in a pew on Sunday and listen to a preacher, I think it'll help you understand your preachers better. But at the same time, it's how we communicate and how we can communicate better by use of illustrations or illustrative energy. In the homiletical community, it ends up being illustrations is this broad term that describes all kinds of things that are going on, and there's many more ways to describe this. So on today's podcast, I have Dr. Matt Friedemann, Dr. Alice McKenzie, Dr. Miriam Platt, Commissioner Sue Swanson. Then on the second half, this, it got to be so good and so long that I had to break this up into two episodes. We have Elijah Friedemann, Captain um, Captain Antoine Yoakum. I almost called him Lieutenant in my mind. I was thinking, of the, I was like, a Captain, who's that? Uh, Captain Antoine Yoakum, Major Andy Miller Jr., my father, and then Reverend Stan Key. And I have each of them give us their best illustration or one of their favorite illustrations. So I think you're really going to enjoy this. I want to just take a minute to thank our sponsors, um, Bill Roberts at WilliamHRoberts.com. He's a financial planner who works with ministry leaders all over the country and does an amazing job helping people achieve their financial goals. And he does this in a Christian way. He's particularly skilled at helping people who work for the Salvation Army or are Salvation Army officers. And he's an officer's kid himself. He's somebody who believes in the ministry of this podcast. And I'm so appreciative of him coming along. So check him out at WilliamHRoberts.com. And then, as usual, WPO Development. I'm so thankful for Keith Waters and his team coming along to support us. You might notice that Keith and his team work all over the country. They've done more than 250 capital campaigns for the Salvation Army. That Not only that, just uh, leading and guiding capital campaigns, they also help people with mission planning studies to figure out if they need to do a campaign in the first place. And then strategic planning, they do a great job and likely they can come to you and they're, the, they're, they're not just like gonna sit on the other side of a phone and give you advice. Keith and his team are people who come and sit down with you, sit down with board members and donors and help develop a plan and make it happen. So you can find out more about him at keith.waters at wpodevelopment.com or you can just Google WPO Development. Thanks so much for checking out the More to Story podcast. God bless you. Hi, friends. I am here with my friend, Captain Antoine Yoakum, who leads the Salvation Army in Johnson City, Tennessee. Antoine, welcome. Hey, Andy. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I'm excited to have you on here and I really I've, I've known you've preached at various events for you know youth group large youth group settings and you preach every week I'd love to just think how you think through illustrations and, and even how you find them and how you keep them together like and 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 so that you can utilize them yeah man that's a good question I mean all of us preachers and teachers I think it's, it's this connection, you know, that we can make for our audience to the scripture that we're sharing or the, the, the passage that we're working through. And I, I, before I go to any illustration, I always start with my exegesis and I try to make sure that it's sound. I, I, I try to work to make sure that the biblical principles that I'm wanting to share are solid, you know, as far as what the word of God is telling telling me and sharing with me. And, and from that point, I kind of go back to a list that I keep in my notes app. I save, I save links to articles that I read. I, I save links to... Um, uh, videos that I come across, um, and and I really just kind of work the materials from everywhere. And I I learned very early on in, in my time as an ordained pastor in the Salvation Army that illustrations uh, are, are are everywhere, and, and and you never know when you can use one, right? right. And, and and I don't discriminate where they come from. I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I I get illustrations from secular sources, secular shows, um, because. 
you know, the reality is we all connect differently to things that are happening around us, you know, right. and so that's kind of how I approach it. The scripture first, and then I go through kind of a database, if you will, that I have in my phone. I, at one time, I was using OneNote, and I was using some other apps to keep things organized, and I just realized it's so much easier just to keep it at my fingertips, and I open up my computer. I can just kind of uh, peruse, you know, what I have. What um what app do you use? As far as illustration skills. Um, oh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, the, the Notes app in your it's iPhone. A, it's the Apple yeah. Notes app. Okay, gotcha. Is yeah. that... Do you create like a folder or something on there? Or you just put it in and just put illustrations or what? It's just, it's just a running note that says illustrations. And, you know, and for me, it's just a quick way. If I'm watching a YouTube video, maybe I'm watching one of your podcasts or oh, something. Oh, thank you. Or, you know, I, really, if, I, if something resonates with me, I'll put it in my notes app and I'll just put a note there. Um, uh, God's abiding presence. So, you know, whatever the thing is that clicks with me i'll just put a note there that way i can quickly reference hey maybe this works you know maybe this yeah, will yeah. will help inspire someone else to to see this passage in a way that i think god wants them to yeah so so what are some things that you try to do or well, let's, let me say it like this How, what, what are some things you try not to do we all have there's some dangers in uh expanding on a story in a way that might not be true or um, uh, yeah. telling us, talking about your kids too much. I mean, what, what are some of the parameters you have for illustrations? Well, number one, I never pick an illustration before I'm clear on the biblical principles. Um, because gotcha. I, I think the tendency is if we see an illustration and, oh, the story moves us or whatever's happening, then uh, if we're not careful, I think we all have been there. We'll, we could potentially bend the, the, the scripture text to to, 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 you know, kind of combine with the illustration. And that's very dangerous. While some people are incredibly effective at doing that, making the Bible say what they want to say, that we know that God's word is sound, that it's true yeah. and can be trusted. And so that's one of the big ones for me. And that's been a pitfall um, early on in my preaching, working on the illustration before I'm even completely clear on what the passage is trying to reveal to, 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 my, to me first. And then to my congregation. So that's number one. Number two is I think there's so many things that we're interacting with in our environment that can be very useful. That can be very useful to um, uh, us as preachers and teachers. I mean, you know, we're called uh, to be in the world, just not of the world. And so I think it's very important that we are, we're sensing, we're taking it in. And, and then we use that to uh, leverage, um, you know, yeah. our experiences to teach the word of God. The other thing that I do, I try to do is I watch a lot of preachers and teachers. I follow a lot of people, um, particularly um, I, I like um, Dr. Tony Evans. He's probably yeah. one of my, my favorite yeah. preachers. Uh, no, number one, he's biblically sound. I, I've Absolutely. not found him to be ever preaching something that cannot be um, supported with the scriptures. And number two, he's an excellent uh, storyteller. And, you know, yeah. You know, he always draws me in with what he's talking about. And it may be something that I can't relate to, but I'm always ready once he lays out the illustrations. And that's really what an illustration is. We're, we're trying to submit that teaching you know, in our being so that when we encounter that issue or that scenario, that we can draw on the teachings, right? And so yes, yes. I like Tony Evans. I like Tony Evans. I, I will say this too, that there are a lot of preachers whose theological slant I don't necessarily resonate with, right? I, I, um, you know, you know, so some of those, uh, just just to be frank, you know, Creflo Dollar. Uh, yeah. Th there's some, um, Mike Todd. Th there's some who, uh, frankly, I don't resonate with their theological slant, you know, and kind of how they approach teaching the word. However, I, those individuals have great teams whose man. primary job is to create material. It, it, that's what yeah. they're hired to do, right? Right, uh, right. So yeah, I got you. Just so you know, I, I do something. Um, even some of our, my students who will watch this video, um, they might be wondering and, and call me to the heresy police by some of the things I've had them read because I want them to read uh, widely. And there are some great heretical preachers out there. <laughs> I mean, I mean that I'm kind of being funny there, sure. but uh, the idea is like. Look, we can learn from their communication style. And, and for That's what right. it's worth, like I have Michael, uh, our students will be listening to Michael Todd, but also yeah. Tony Evans too, yeah. Um, yeah. just as examples. So I love, love those, those, um, love Tony Evans as a boy. I love listening right. to him and I, and yeah. Pris Priscilla Schreier too. We, I'm having, yeah, our she's students great. Listen to her too. So that's great. Yeah. Uh, any other, any other thoughts you have on illustrations? 
Uh, you, you know, I, I just, I pulled from a wide source. Some of my more formal uh, uh, pieces that I use, I love Chuck Swindle. I love, I love the stuff that he puts out. I mean, very good at telling the story and drawing in, you know, the reader. Uh, Warren Grigsby, I love his commentary. The thing is, I have a, a little Holman's concordance, topical concordance um, that Holman's puts out. And I like it because it kind of, it, it's a clear cut. These are the texts that may speak to this topic. You know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah. that's been very helpful to me sometimes if, if I, depending on what's going on in my life, if I'm just having a hard time kind of getting there, you, you know, yeah, yeah. then I'll go to some of these texts that are more kind of structured, laid out in a more uh, concise framework, right? It's easier for me to work through. Um, but my rule of thumb in general is how is God speaking to me through the things around me? I, I my preference is to use personal illustrations. Yeah. Now I may read a Tony Evans illustration and I first ask, well, how does this relate to me? Have I experienced what he is talking about? And if the case is yes, then I will mold that into something I've experienced. Because sure. I think the trans the transparency for me, Tone, and allows the, the listener to hear what I want to say, right? To hear yeah. what, excuse me, to hear what God wants to say through me. And so that's been very effective for my preaching. If I can make it relate to me, then it's a yeah. lot easier for me to take the biblical principles and, and intertwine them with how I want them to connect with the text. Right. A lot of times the, when you have an illustration, you hear somebody else use an illustration. You're like, well, I had that experience right. or I had, it just sheds a little light. I don't know. Little doors open up and you have to be willing to push through them. Right. To, That's to right. Be able to develop those illustrations. That's well, right. I wish I had more time. I, I like to talk to you longer. Maybe we'll, maybe this will be a, maybe I'll stop teaching and just talk to my people. I enjoy. <laughs> uh, give me one of your top illustrations. One that like, all right, you're thrown up at a Rotary Club or, or, or uh, you come to chapel. I say, hey, Antoine, come up and share. And uh, yeah. you, have, you have to pull it out real fast, but you know it's a good yeah. one. G yeah. Give it to us. My son was going to be born. My son is now 12. Uh, um, when I found out he was going to be born, I was over the moon excited. Um, and, and I did many things. My wife and I, we did many things. We, we would prepare the room. We prepared the crib. You know, we had uh, the toys ready and the blankets and all these things. And, and one of our rituals, if you will, was in, in the evening times, I would lay beside my wife and I would sing to my son. I, I would sing, give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks. And I would sing this song over and over over the months as Makai was developing in his mother's womb and as he's developing anyway fast forward to November 17th uh, it was 8 9 p.m my wife had been in labor for uh, nearly 24 hours and oh, wow uh, and so Makai is born he comes into the world right and you know when newborns are, are born you know they they uh, administer the apgar they test the baby's reflexes they're cleaning them off a cleaning table and he's screaming his head off head off like like all newborn babies do and he's screaming and he's screaming and, and and as a dad i have this precious precious opportunity just to be there with him and i'm teary-eyed and you know the emotions that you have when you see your children come into the world and he's screaming and he's screaming and and, and i reached down i put my index finger in his palm and i began to sing the song oh, right man. give thanks with a grateful heart and all of a sudden he just stops crying you, oh, you know, and, and I start crying even more. The nurses are crying even more. And, you know, the thing is for Makai, my son, this was new. Uh, yeah. This was chaotic. This was chaotic. This, this was nothing he had ever Ooh. experienced. He had been pulled out of his comfort zone. He appeared to be in terror and he screamed and he screamed. And then my abiding voice that had been with him for the nine months leading, leading up to Ooh. his birth, right? He, he heard that voice. He heard my voice Amen. and it calmed him and it calmed him. And so I'm just reminded that we're living in such a, a chaotic time. Right? Yeah. Yeah. There, there's so much information coming at us that unsettles us. We see mortality statistics daily as we relate to COVID and we see all these things. And, and I'm just reminded that in John chapter 16, um, the Lord Jesus essentially says, listen, all these things are never going to go away. Right? Yeah. He, he says it's so chaotic in this world, but listen to me. Stop yeah. crying. Be Amen. at peace. Amen. I knew all these things were coming. Amen. I knew all these things were going to happen. Take heart. Ooh. I've overcome them. Amen. Right? right? Yeah. Amen. Oh, Antoine, that is good. Ah, uh, that is really good. I um now it might not work as well uh, with me singing "Give Thanks" as it does with you. You sound pretty good. Oh man, thanks so much for taking some time with me here. And uh, you know, we'll we'll be in touch. But thanks, thanks for taking time with my class and maybe this podcast too. Hey, bless you, Andy. Thank you. All right, thanks. Hi.
Awesome. Well, I'm glad to have with me my friend, the Vice President for Admissions, Elijah Friedman, who also serves as the founding pastor of the Foundry Church, which is here in the Jackson area. Elijah, welcome. Man, it's good to be here. Happy to talk about preaching today. Absolutely. And I've been really impressed by your preaching and thankful that I've been able to experience it here a little bit. My family visited Foundry and checking you out online too. So we're talking about illustrations with our preaching class. And I, what I'm thinking of this is like, if, if I could have brought everybody in and we could be around a round table, I'd have some preachers who would be able to share their experiences with illustrations particularly. But I'm just curious, Elijah, like how do you work through the process of developing illustrations and what do you do with them? Or do you just like, as you're working on a sermon, magically come up with some, they just come to your mind, the Holy Spirit comes out and delivers them to you or, or how does it work? Yeah, I usually come up with the points I need, and then I try to go live interesting stories that week to fill in the gap. You know, <laughs> figure out what experience would be good. No, so, so what I do, and I guess there's really no, I don't have a clear linear process, but as I'm working out the biblical content, which is the main portion of what you always want to share, like biblical content comes first. I'll actually, in the top right-hand corner of wherever I'm taking notes, and I always try to do it on a physical piece of paper. I avoid screens as much as possible in the, the sermon writing process. Okay. I'll start jotting down ideas. Uh, so, for instance, I just preached this past week on Luke 15 and preached from the lost story of the lost sheep and the lost coin. And so I know it's going to be lost kind of illustrations. And so I start jotting down lost illustrations or evangelism illustrations in the top right as they come to mind. What I find is that my mind, probably like lots of ours, has been trained by technology to not focus in and fo follow linear processes very well. And so I'll have random thoughts come up. And instead of trying to refocus myself I just take that thought put it on paper and then keep going with the biblical content but that means by the time I get to, to done with the biblical content and come and say here are my points or here's my big point how do I illustrate it I've got some illustrations going already so that's the that's kind of the first major step I take the other thing is is I make sure I'm always writing down stories that take place I don't think I have a particularly interesting life but I've got tons of amazing illustrations because from the time I was about 18 years old, I've been writing down illustrations and sure. I forget some and don't write them down, but when you can keep them, keep a repository of illustrations, it makes it so much easier. So I've had many times Saturday night or even Sunday morning. I think, man, I really need another illustration to connect this together, to engage people. I'll pull up Evernote, which is where I keep mine. Uh, Evernote, which is a program people can get for free. I'll type in a couple words and I'll have a, a list of four or five illustrations and say, you know what? I haven't used that one for probably a year or two. I can pull it in here and use it there. Yeah. So that, that's kind of why it's, there's really not a, I don't have a really good process for it. Um, often I try to pull from recent stuff too. So really something that might've happened this week, pull in a, uh, a recent thing. Um, but an example of that, it's not so much an illustration, but I started off for Luke 15, the, there's joy in heaven when someone comes, a, a sinner repents. And so I talked about what, what brings us joy. That was kind of the opening question to kind of create some, create some interest. And so I talked about different things that bring us joy. Well, the Spider-Man No Way Home trailer came out, which is the oh, most, right. in the first 24 hours, most watched trailer of all time. And I know in my young oh, congregation, really? yeah, wow. it's amazing, more than any other uh, trailer. And so I, I knew a lot of people in my congregation watched that. So I said, maybe you're a Marvel fan or a Spider-Man fan. And, you know, so I'll bring up something like that, which is not an illustration, but I would say it's like an illustrative point. Like it's a, it's yes, a little yes. thing to bring people in. So exactly. that's kind of a wandering answer, but I'd love to, I'd love to hear any, any questions or thoughts on that. Oh, no, that's good. And I like what you said, because it's so important. An illustration does not mean a five minute story at the end or like Correct. a major biblical point, And now you, or your exegetic point, And now you tell an illustration. Some people are that formulaic. Sometimes it's a couple of words. Yeah. It's just, it's just a shading of something, but it's engaging senses and helping people have light on a passage. So I, now I'm, I want to back up in your sermon preparation process. I like what you said about not being on a screen. So talk to me about what do you mean by that? I know that's like a personal commitment probably for you too, like in your own spiritual disciplines, but what do you mean by that in the sermon preparation process? So I think, and this, I have nothing to back this up. This is what <laughs> I think. I think screens can very easily be spiritually deadening. Wow. And it, it may just be the fact that, that when we use this, this screen in front of me right now, I so often use it for work so I'm, it's maybe related to stress or pressure or i use it for entertainment and watching things so when i'm coming to the act of engaging spiritually this screen i'm not using it for that any other time i think it's, it's challenging because i can so easily either just start using it for something else 
um, or just looking at a screen. I, I really think there's something that is, is um, and this is way too strong of a word, but dehumanizing or pulls us out of our embodiedness sure. and going to a screen. And yeah. so for me, I try to, I try to use written. Now that I, I use a Bible software, so I will go to it for that. But other than that, and then the final step of getting my final outline transferred over so I can keep it to my computer, uh, I just use pen and paper the rest of the time. Wow. Uh, I, and I think there is something really powerful that I, I do. It's funny. A lot of the things you, you do intuitively, I do something very similar. Like I use Evernote, mm-hmm. but it's just because I, I can use a, a tech, like I can speak to text there, but I also have like a, a notebook like this. There's something yeah. for me about starting the process there, the exegetical process. And I showed my class this past week how it's important for me to draw. And I, I require our students to do a, a plot map. And I prefer for that to be um, not electronic. Like, I don't want you mm-hmm. dealing with publisher. I just want like engaging another set. Like there, there's, there's friction that comes as you take a pen to a piece of paper. Yeah, that I, yeah there I, is. I, I don't know what it is, but there's something to that. Um, okay, so that, that's really interesting, Elijah, as you're able to highlight your own process. Now, when you, when, oh, oh I'm gonna back up to one other thing. So you and I have, must have had this similar experience because we were on a business trip <laughs> together. We were. Two weeks ago, and I, I had this high honor. It's not, not been since I was a kid and uh, my dad used me an illustration. I didn't know it. But this past week at the Foundry Church, I was a part of an illustration. Yeah, I felt like a kid again uh, because I was like in my dad's illustration, but I had that down as well. We had an experience. So tell us that experience. What, what yeah, we so, together. so so we flew in and I'll, I'll tell a short version. I, I, this is one of those stories I did expand out to kind of engage people and play for laughs a little bit, everything else. But so we, we're traveling up to North Carolina. We get there a little bit early. We decided to go to a Panera. And so we, we plunked down to the Panera and we're there for three or four hours. Yeah. And it's us kind of just these two guys. And then it's a bunch of old people. I feel like we're in there and then a bunch of college age girls. So we didn't really fit in, but that's okay. We were okay with that. And so we're there. And I, at one point I'm running out of battery on my computer. So I've got to move somewhere else. You come back in, you're on a phone call, you move with me and we get ready to leave and we can't find the keys to the car. And I say, we very generously, you couldn't <laughs> find the keys to the car. Uh, so you were driving and, and the so rental we, car, we were, rental car, the rental car. Yeah. Even worse. So we look, everywhere for it we walk around we do the thing where you walk by the a lady was sitting where we were sitting before so we kind of walk by it first and give her the side eye just to see if the keys are over there and, and then we walk up and have her move and we're moving people around we're asking to see footage and we're doing everything can't find them so we call we call an uber we call the rental place they've got to come tow the car it's all over and then you you had the brilliance of like oh. thinking okay let me walk back through do the sherlock holmes thing and think okay what could have happened and you realize when we walked in, you had thrown something away. So we go, we lose all self-respect at that point. We go, we pull the okay. trash out, we lift it up, we, we start digging through it, and we see the keys down there. And so I was, I was about to go head first into the trash to pull them out. But you <laughs> thought, let's, just, let's just make a little opening here and pull them out, and we got our keys. What was lost was found by the grace of God. Amen. Oh, that's good. And I, I don't know how I'm going to use it, but I'm going to use it at some point. Now, what's interesting about that is you did two things that I want students to recognize. One is you're self-deprecating in that. You you made me look out like as I was a good guy. Well, I'm the one who about blew our trip. Like I'm the one, well, but, and also you you demonstrate like, well, I'll go head in. And, and, and when you told that on Sunday, you also acknowledge, well, maybe I had something to do with this. Maybe it's my fault. And I think that that's really important not, not to make yourself into the hero, but uh, to come to a place where you, when you use humor, to use it in a self-deprecating way. The other thing I think is interesting is I imagine you told that story in conversation, maybe at the office, maybe with your family or something. Um, but that, or let me ask, did you do that? Have you, did you tell it? Yeah, yeah, it had definitely, it had definitely come up once or twice before, um, before I shared it on a Sunday morning. Right. Had, so, so you have a chance every time you tell it, Yes. You have a chance. I think first of all, we do we do lose out on some details, which is why it's important to write it down. Amen. Like write down everything key. So that way, because we want to be faithful in relating what's actually happened, even in an illustration. But then yeah, I, I start to find out what works. So next time I tell it, I'd forgotten that time, although it is Sunday, to tell the fact that the reason I said we moved to a new place is because I thought maybe someone had stolen the keys because I had moved and left your stuff unattended, right? Which right, is a right. great because everyone's felt that before. It's a great way to highlight a little humor there. And so next time I'll be sure to say it. But yeah, the more you say it, the more you can kind of hone in on what the key points are. 
and and then there's power because then you get you've got these key points you know what connects you know what works and then you, most importantly you know what drives to a point point. and yes. i think that's the key is not just have details have details but it's all got to ultimately drive down to a point right and that's what happens that's what comedians do you know comedians will get in and they'll work a joke and they'll say like when it doesn't go well well i don't want to go yell i'm go well yet i'm still working it i'm still trying to mm -hmm. find where it has life and where it turns and where where the story has a punch. T tell me about like the, the danger or how you, what you try to avoid and maybe expanding too much on the story, <laughs> and making more out of it than it is. Or what ethical pieces do you have with illustrations? Yeah, so so for me, one one ethical consideration is am I am I sharing something I shouldn't about someone? So right. for instance, I, I almost Andy almost reached out to you before I shared. I knew I was going to present it in a way. Where I was gonna, I was gonna put myself as kind of the the dumb one there in, in a couple right, ways, right. self-deprecating. But but if, if I thought it might have reflected even a little bit poorly on you, I would have called and checked with you beforehand. So yeah. I try to do that for sure. Um, but then the other thing is, yeah, there's it's easy to expand it way out from what it is. And I think that's that's a tough one because anytime you're telling a story, you do want to highlight maybe the absurd or highlight the tension or highlight the humorous. But you don't want to make that trip to Panera, you know, feel like it was this this great escapade that they could make a movie about because it wasn't. Um, yeah. I think there's a tension there. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know exactly what to say. And there is a tension there. And we've got to make sure ultimately, and this is why writing down the details are so important, that 10 tellings from now, we're not telling something that just didn't happen. Right. Um, you know, right. Me, me talking about how we called the police and they were looking for the keys and all that. We've got to be really careful uh, not to, because I, I know if, I'm not going to say names, but I know of pastors who have done that, preachers who have done that. And they right. tell the stories and they get challenged on it. And they say, well, whoops, it didn't really happen that way. And that's that's not what we want to have in our preaching ministry. And, you know, for me, I've occasionally like ch changed the way I've quoted somebody um, or like related to my kids. And I try to be really faithful with that, because particularly as my family is listening, they know that if I change the story that I'm not telling the truth or it's not yeah. exactly how it happened. So that's, again, like like you said, writing it down. Like I'll write things down as they happen. Like I even joke, like I have this one really great illustration where my son Titus um, did some, I won't tell the whole thing, but it, he's, he jumped up after he fell off his bike and he said, I saved myself. And he didn't acknowledge that I was the one who actually saved his life. And, but I, I even in the, when I tell the illustration, if I'm around enough pastors, I'll say, I'm like, what do you mean you saved yourself? But thanks for the illustration, right? Yeah. <laughs> like I know um, sometimes it immediately I'm like, oh, that's going in. That's yep. going in the pile. Yep. And it's, so I think it's important to, to not only live a somewhat interesting life, but also to, to write down when you have interesting experiences, because we all do. Um, and often I find it's, it's in the fairly mundane things like being at a Panera and losing some keys, which we could just push right past. That's going to be a story. I'll tell that story for the next 20 years. In different capacities. Awesome! I made it um, into Elijah's. You made it, man. You made it into the Chronicles. canon finally. Yes, but it's it, it's a great. So it's a small thing, but if you hold on to it, and we've already, you and I have talked independently about how we can tell it in different ways. There's there's about four or five different points to that story, depending on right. how you tell it, and you can tell it with integrity every time, but just highlight a different aspect of it. So there's power. Well, let's riff on that for a second. So, uh, like I my I thought of that illustration of getting in and getting dirty, like. It was almost a place where when we, we lifted up the bag and here we are looking at this monstrosity of Panera garbage, we had to decide, <laughs> like, I don't want to get, I don't want to go in there at all. Like, yeah. it's not worth it. The, the tow truck is already on the way. I had to call. I mean, we could just give up. Well, and of course, I'm not going to do that. But that there's a there's light that can be generated from that. What, what else do you see from that story? Oh man, there's probably a ton. I haven't really thought about it yet. So one is one is being willing to lose your dignity for things that things that matter. Yeah. So like sure. going through the trash. I remember like you went up multiple times to the counter and was like, was there any way we can check? Or like, can you guys double check in the back or can we check? And asking people to move. I remember walking around outside and talking to this couple, having a sweet conversation, very nice. I said, Hey, can we look around? So you just kind of lose your dignity when you're trying to when you're trying to find something. And I think you use that about, I mean, so many times throughout the scripture, people losing their dignity for things that matter. Right. Um, so that's right. one. Um, I could go with another one while you think. Uh, I, yeah. I, could, I could think too, like I was, you could just compare it to a low moment. Like I was, I, I'm not like trying really hard to impress you, but you're a colleague. Here we are. I was kind of responsible for this trip that we were on. And I felt so bad. I felt incredibly like I had blown it. Somehow here I am, my new friend, my new colleague. And 
we we're stuck. We are completely stuck here. We're gonna have to get an Uber. We're gonna have to pay a lot of money. I was thinking like I was in a kind of a low place, but I was trying to get myself to stay up because I have my new friend here who I'm not yeah. just trying to impress, but I I felt like, man, what's he gonna think of me? And so so I don't know quite where that would come in, but there was like kind of a low moment um, where you think all is lost. I <laughs> think not all, not the world's lost, but it was going to be pretty yeah, but, but every, see, everybody can relate to that emotion. And so even if you're, you're jumping off into something of like an actual, like massive low moment of life, everyone can relate to that moment in the emotion that goes on there. I think yeah. it's big. I, 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 there, there's a bunch more that can come out of it. I think one is, is like the power of memory, remembering. Oh, and right. ultimately, how did we find it? It's, it's by remembering. So we had done, we had done all this activity, but when we stopped and remembered and look at the Bible, the Psalms are filled with like, remember yeah. this, right? Don't forget this. So you could do a whole, you could do a whole point on that is, we're, in life, we're rushing around, we're doing everything, we're doing all the steps, but when we stop and we remember, there's yeah. power in that, and there's, you know, there's, there's something centering in that that gets us back on track, something like that. I mean, I, I really think we could sit here and probably come up yeah, with 10 different good. ways to present this. I, 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 we won't do anything else. I'd ask you to give an illustration unless you really want to do it, but I think this is a helpful process just showing ways we can do it, and actually, the data of the story was I found the piece of garbage in the rental car, and I was kind of frustrated by it, and I took that piece of garbage in my hands were full. I had my computer bag. I had something else and the keys were kind of awkward. And so I brought the garbage into Panera when we arrived and put it in. And that's when the keys slipped out with it. But it was, oh, I, this is another way I could go. That garbage became the key, that Perrier bottle, whatever it was, mm -hmm. became the key to finding the keys. So we went looking for the Perrier bottle. And yeah. uh, what was what seemed to be like a worthless thing that got in our way was really the ticket for us to to find yeah. uh, solution. Yeah, I don't know how that works. I need to play at that one a little more. There's a way. There's just a way to make it work. That's the beauty of a good illustration. Is like ultimately it's, it's about emotion and connecting and humor and in, a little bit of insight as well and bringing that together and, and you can bring it together in ten different ways. I love it. Yeah. Well, Elijah, is there anything else you want to add about illustrations? I don't think so. Other than just say, make sure you use enough of them. I don't think most preachers oh, use enough illustrations. I, I don't, I don't like listening to most preachers because they are boring. I don't care <laughs> how good your biblical insight is. People need to laugh. People need to think emotionally or embrace emotion. Uh, people need to, to be able to look at their own experience and see how it relates back and illustrations do all of that. So I, when I look, when I look at my outline, I make sure sometimes I even write this down. I'll, I'll draw a smiley face around something humorous oh, I'm going to do yeah. or like an exclamation mark around something that's going to be significant to make sure I have a good flow throughout my message to where I don't have 20 minutes of biblical content and then a little illustration appended to the end. Um, yeah. I think it needs to be regular. And I, I preach to, I preach to a congregation that's, that's mostly 18 to 30. And so I do it differently, but I try not to go more than two to five minutes without at least having a, a little something to, wow. to kind of bring everybody back in and get their minds centered back on the content. Now, your dad, the PhD in education, says you need something every minute. Yeah, and that's yeah, a lot. That's, that's a whole lot to do. He, yeah. I mean, now, he's not just, like you said, it's, it might just be a word or an image or something that gets people's attention. Now, it's interesting. We have two father and son duos on this. I had my dad on to talk oh, about nice. this. So now I have at least two of the Freedomans. So thanks yeah, so much fun. for your time, Elijah. It means a lot to me. Absolutely. Enjoyed it. Thanks for having me on, Andy. All right. Bye. Well, I'm glad to have in the class and on the podcast with me, one of my favorite preachers, and that's Dr. Don Adams, who happens to be my father-in-law. And I think my preaching has grown significantly for, for two, in two ways. One, I've listened to Don preach for now 20 years, but also I had access to his library when I come to visit through the years, and I learned a lot, I would just spend hours in there piecing through, you know, his books and, and enjoying the things he's read. And obviously, I also had a significant contribution to the, my development theologically. But beyond that, Don is an expert at using illustrations. So, Don, welcome to the class. Thank you. It's my great privilege to be a part of this. I'm excited about you because I know how important it is and that you were taught well when you were at this point in your life. Yeah. Um, well, what is it? How is it that you go through the process of acquiring illustrations? And then how do you 
keep them, like keep them in a place where you can use them so you can employ them. I and mean, that's one of the challenges that people have. I mean, I've been there occasionally when I'm writing a sermon, I'm thinking, oh, what would be the right illustration? Well, and it's, it's hard to, sometimes they come in those moments, but generally there's some work that comes in cultivating them. Well, I wish I could say I had that great filing system, uh, <laughs> but let me just say, I've, uh, I was sort of imprinted like a baby duck is imprinted by the, the pastor that I listened to after I became a Christian who used illustrations very powerfully, a lot of them out of his personal life. So, you know, it became uh, just grooved into my mind that you needed these stories uh, to, to really sort of land the blow uh, with the truth. So that's always been important to me. As far as how I manage, um, you know, gathering illustrations, of course, I, when I hear a good illustration, I write it down. When I'm listening to preaching, I make notes. Usually, if I write something down, it's an illustration. I, I know I was at Indian Springs camp meeting a couple of years ago when these three great preachers preached, and I had a legal pad. And when I got home, I had about 15 pages wow. of illustrations. And, uh, uh, you know, as to how I access them every now and then, I just pick that pad up and I look through it to refresh my mind. Even now, although I'm not writing new sermons on a regular basis, uh, I've also there. There have been a few authors, uh, particularly Philip Yancey. Okay. I, I think I own at least three copies of every book Philip Yancey ever wrote because <laughs> he he has made me seem a lot smarter than I actually am because his, <laughs> his illustrations just range all kinds of literature. Uh, all kinds of academic people, you know, he just is one of those rare folks that has a, a broad scope of information at his disposal. So he's been, I think, probably the most significant source. I don't file those in any particular way, but it's interesting. Oftentimes when I'm thinking about a sermon, I can see an illustration in one of his books in my mind. Now, I don't have wow. any kind of photographic memory, but I will get up and Sometimes I may have to go through two or three different books uh, to find them. I underline them and that sort of thing. And there's so many, uh, you know, and when I've used them, then I write used in the margin. <laughs> so I don't use them again because I try not to, you know, use right. illustrations over and over again. Well, that has been careful. I'm, you know, I'm sad, of course, for the, the moral failure we learned about Ravi Zacharias, but his books were also a great source of illustrations. Uh, yeah. Again, a little bit like Yancey, all different kinds, not just, uh, you know, homey little stories. I mean, I have a book by an old preacher named William Stidger that I got from my father-in-law. And uh, I think it's called There Are Sermons and Stories or something like that. Interesting. And he was a really good storyteller. I mean, it was his, and I never heard him preach. He was way before my time. But, you know, I have that book. I had a book by uh, one of our United Methodist bishops. Uh, named Kennedy, I can't remember his first name, that I used. I mean, I'm not above using books. I have a book of Charles Swindoll. Uh, yeah. There's, it's a very thick book, and I inherited that from my father-in-law. I think the title is something like The Tale of the Tardy Ox Wagon. <laughs> that anyway, wow. yeah. Swindoll, I, you know, even yet, I will still pull that book off the shelf. It's topical. And right. To just look at that. For years, I took... Uh, uh, the magazine, the Christianity Today, the other, the leadership. Oh, and right. For many years, they always had a section of illustrations. They probably have published a book or two of illustrations from leadership. I, I haven't looked at that, but that's been another source. And a lot of times I can remember for years, I could remember, you know, even what month those illustrations were in. And, uh, and then in my last church before I retired, I paid uh, hmm. I don't know, sermon dot com. Uh, yeah, sure. One of, one of those services like that. I think it was about seventy dollars a year, and I don't know about you know other preachers, but I mean a really good illustration is worth seventy dollars. <laughs> <laughs> if it really yeah, sure. lands the punch in a sermon, and of course I would get many more than one, and again those would be kind of topical or textual, and there are some free services. Uh, yeah. You know, the ones you pay for, sometimes like in sermon.com, it will, it will say, you know, you have, to, you have to have a subscription to get these illustrations. And you always assume, well, those must be the better ones. But I've used free services as well. So those are all 
uh, you know, the ways yeah. I, just, I just like to, uh, when, I, when I'm reading, my whole life has been a search for illustrations. I mean, everything, <laughs> yeah. really, everything I read, everything I watch, you know, it's, I'm just constantly looking to harvest them. Awesome. One of the things is interesting is like, so you preached for, you know, over 30 years and then um, you had a few years after, I mean, I'm guessing about and then over, you know, close to 45 altogether, but in the middle of it, after I think 20 or 30 years, you became a district superintendent where you were responsible for 60 churches or so, and you visited them. What, and you made some observations about other preachers in that time period. What, what was your, what, what were those observations particularly related to illustrations? Well, as I think I said already, I, I was just amazed at how many pastors would not use illustrations. Now, there are gifted people that, I mean, Charles uh, Stanley doesn't, doesn't much use illustrations. I don't know if you, if you pay attention to him, he doesn't tell a lot of stories. He, he just sort of gets up and unfolds the truth. And he can, he can do that because he's got a charisma that gives punch, uh, you know, through his personality and through the spirit in him. Uh, but most pastors are not that way. And uh, I, that, that was my biggest surprise. I, a lot of times pastors would be well prepared. I have to say, uh, I don't know whether the students you have would realize this, but lay people are not dumb. And I, I would have, well, maybe a few, but I would, <laughs> I would have lay people say to me, I think our preacher's getting his sermons off the internet. Wow. And that was not a compliment. Wow. Uh, you know, so that's just one of those things. Now, it's, I've never been good at borrowing other people's sermons. It paralyzes me. Mm. Uh, if I pick up a Sunday school quarterly and look at a lesson, I can't teach it. I, I've got to just take the scripture and figure out what the truth in it is. So I've not been good. Now, uh, David Siemens, who was the pastor, you know, in my college and part of seminary years, I've borrowed a lot of ideas from him. Uh, yeah. I don't even, I'm not hardly even Ill, uh, outlines. I just, just not good at doing that. So, and so you were asking about other preachers. So that was, that was my biggest observation is, is the failure to use illustrations. Cause sometimes again, as I said earlier, an illustration is worth, I mean, it, you know, a solid goal. It, it can make yeah. the difference in a sermon that just sort of, you know, people say, well, that was nice. Or one where they say, I'm going to remember that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I wish we had more time to talk through this a little further. I'd love to hear, too, even more about David Siemens, one of the great preachers um, who impact a lot of people. And, you know, a lot, and we're aware of two challenges that came up in his life, but just so thankful for the way God used him. I, I'd love to, for you just to give um, one illustration that you know, I, I know we probably might not have time for a long one, but yeah, everybody seems to have a, a couple kind of in their back pocket that they can pull out at some point. So what's one of your favorite illustrations you could tell us? Okay, well, I've got one real short one and one a little bit longer. One okay. I recently concerned a professor at the University of Montana named yeah. Barlow, and this has probably been two generations ago. He was studying hookworm, and there at that time, there was no treatment for it, and it's a very terrible disease and a terrible death. I mean, people just slowly die. Uh, from hookworm. So he eventually went to the Middle East and spent two years trying to isolate the, the, uh, the, uh, the what is it that, anyway, uh, it's not a virus, but the parasite. I'm sorry, okay. the parasite. And he, when he, he finally did, he put it in a test tube, went back to the States, and of course, U.S. Customs did what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to keep stuff like that out of the country. Oh, so wow. they said, you know, you know, we're going to have to take that away from you. So while they stepped away, he opened the test tube and drank it. Oh, my goodness. And, and went back to Montana and got very, very ill and nearly died before surgeons were able to get into his stomach and find that parasite and save his life. Well, to me, that's an illustration that preaches itself. That's what Jesus did. <laughs> Amen. He took, you know, our condemnation uh, into wow. himself. He bore it. He bore, and then, of course, he died. He let it kill him. Uh, wow. So that's one of those illustrations that, in fact, I think when I told it, I said, you know, I don't even need to comment on that illustration. <laughs> you know, it tells itself. Another little shorty I love is the young priest who was hearing his first confession, and the older priest was listening in. And when he got done, he said, well, Father, he said, how do you think I did? He said, well, you were doing well until you said, you didn't. 
<laughs> you know, a story like that is a way of saying, you know, a lot of people have done stuff that, you know, it's not just you. You're not the only sinner out there. Right. Uh, so th those are just, you know, I, I, those two just jumped into my mind. Thanks for thanks for saying that. And thanks for taking time with us here, Don. We appreciate it. And oh, um, my great privilege. All right. God bless you. Oh, man, this is my privilege to have on with me my hero, Major oh, Andy Miller, Jr. Welcome to the class and the podcast, Dad. Well, thank you very much, son. It's an honor to be here with you. Proud of you guys. You know that. Absolutely. Well, I uh, much of what I can attribute to my public speaking in my in my preaching ministry comes because I watched you week in, week out, and mom as well, uh, yeah. preach faithfully. And but certainly you took on the bulk of the preaching, and you are well known for your illustration. Yeah. So, and, and I mean that with so much yeah, love. Yeah, and I know that. I and we 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 have some. This is like we could talk about this from a few angles, dad, because there's like the side of, of how the kid feels about being in illustrations. But I'll, <laughs> my impression was I always had my chest out, even if it was a little more negative. I love being used, but there's, uh, you know, we maybe yeah. the kids in our family maybe gave you too hard of a time every now and then. Uh, it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. And Honestly, that it was easy illustration. Just had to look into the bedroom and listen a little long, a little while, and you grab a great illustration just on what you all did. Absolutely. Well, uh, Dad, could you just tell us a little bit why you think illustrations are so important and what they do for you in your preaching? I mean, you are somebody who served as a Salvation Army officer for forty-three years, and in retirement, you're still preaching. And uh, so, just talk to me a little bit why illustrations are so important. Well, I think. Uh, well, first of all. And I got to be careful. I don't cover my face. And you know, it's going to be hard for me to talk here and not walk all over the place. <laughs> um, but I, I think, first of all, whenever you're preaching, you don't base it on an illustration. I think it's important to have the scripture and to know what the theme is and to go from there. But illustrations, right. you may never remember what scripture I talked on. Right, right. But people will remember the illustrations. They will say, I've had some, I had some retired officers in one of our corps who heard me twice. And he came up to me and said, would you use that Joe illustration sometime in the near future? Uh, and they, and that was from 30 or 40 years before. They remember wow. the illustrations and it brings the Bible, though the Bible is clear every day, it brings the yeah. Bible into everyday life that any of us can take part with. So I think it's, it's very, very important that it, people can associate the Bible with every day. Yeah. And I think yeah. illustrations do that in a powerful way. Yeah. So how, how do you uh, develop and collate and put together your illustrations? Like, where do you get them? Well, I think first, day, first thing, no question, is it's everyday life. Yeah. It was easier when you were younger. You know, it's, hard, it's hard to make an illustration about some, such a learned man, you know, but I can remember when he wasn't, but, uh, but everyday life, everything you're going through, it, it really is, those things come in, and when you're in your own, um, as we say in Salvation Army Corps, as many of your students will have their own churches, or some call them charges, different things, um, know your people, yeah, because they don't mind you. you. You try not to use them as illustrations, but sometimes it's impossible not to yeah. use them as illustrations. And, uh, and a lot of times your illustrations are from, for me, from as many as one, two, three, or 11 appointments or 12 appointments before. Yeah, yeah. And where those things happen that happen in your life that just fit into the message you're bringing. Yeah. So I think it's know your people. Uh, it is good as you know them for future. Never do anything that would harm anybody. Right. Never do anything that would hurt anybody. And the other thing is, as you know, in a lot of my illustrations, it proves that I wasn't perfect. Amen. Uh, yes. And that we all make mistakes. Uh, we and, and an illustration of that would be we had a soldier in our corps in this plains who was our core treasurer, I won't mention his name, 
But um, he said to me, do you know why I come here? And I said, no, why? He said, because you're the first pastor I ever met that wasn't perfect. Ha. Huh. And it's like, ah, uh, well, huh. I think that's a compliment. Maybe. Right. But it's important that your illustrations, you don't only use illustrations that show you to be Mr. Know-it-all. I was able to take care of this great thing. You know, that Joe illustration right. is one where I learned a lesson from someone who couldn't read and write. Right. And, and so it's good. Um, Let me ask you something. Sure. So one yeah. thing that's one thing that's unique in your preaching, I think there's a lot, there's a temptation to do this, but there's also some allowance in it too. And, and it's a tricky subject because you can't do it all the time, but you not just you will repeat illustrations to the same congregation, yeah. not regularly, but like it's one thing to go to a new church and you you use some of your yeah. old or you your special your special guest someplace and then you reuse an illustration. But yeah. even within the context, talk to me about reusing illustrations and kind of the way you think about that. Well, I think um, that you use that again. You use them when it fits into what you're doing, and it is interesting that and. Even when I am at a, at a core appointment and I'll say something, I said, you will remember when I talked about oh, so-and-so. Okay. That's a good line. Yeah. And let me tell you, it just fits so well here. And I know you've heard it before, but I think it's good. I, and I might say something like the song, you know, um, I love to tell the story to those who know it best. Seems hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. Yeah. And, and to do that, it, they've heard the scripture. We've all heard scripture over and over and over again, and then something will hit us. And yeah. you'll hear that illustration. You say, oh, I know it's coming. Oh, wait a second. Yes, yeah. It's, it's like a good piece of music. Uh, right. Uh, we, we would listen to the same music sometimes for a couple of years on Sunday mornings in our house. Um, yeah. Uh, that international staff band's Blazon CD, Let There Be Praise. Yeah. That was like, that was it. Now I know that piece and I played that piece. I've conducted that piece, but it's like, there's something wonderful about hearing it again. Yeah. And I, I can see occasionally like when you retell a story, an illustration that even though people know what's happening, it's like, if it's good enough, they like yeah. to hear it again. And if you get to that place where it touches their hearts, yes, where yeah. once again, they know what's coming. It's like um, one of our favorite movies. Yes. Hoosiers. <laughs> you know, one of our favorite movie Hoosiers. When you see that guy jumping on the bed because they won the state championship, you can't help but cry a little. You know, right, or right. you take the Indiana National Guard to get me out of here. And <laughs> different things. Um, yeah. You know, those are things that just, you know, it's coming. Yeah. And I think in reality, people know what's coming in every sermon, if you're doing it right, that yeah. there is going to be an appeal to their hearts. Yes. And sometimes God, the Holy Spirit, in, in, in that special way, will all of a sudden, it'll, it'll, it'll hit you. Yeah. Amen. And it's there. And, yeah. And what do you do about it? Well, you know, so, and there's other times, mom, your mother, mother, um, bought me some illustration books yeah you know she was getting a little tired of some of the same illustrations uh -huh. and uh she said it'd be good to use some new and they are good always give credit to where it goes i think that's that important fun. yeah okay yeah. i'm running out of time but i want to make sure to give you a chance so you you, you, I know I could I could predict which one it would be, or I don't know. I maybe the, my siblings and I could have put bets down on what it would be, but normally, and I think you have your top five probably. But give me one of your good illustrations. Just tell it to us like it's in a sermon. How long do you have? Well, we have like probably five minutes. So that okay. Many. Well, I I, th I think it would have you know since I've mentioned it twice, the one about Joe. Okay. You know we're in our first appointment. And I'm a hotshot new lieutenant who had gone through college, which at the time in the Army was not a normal thing. Right, right. And our right. session was the first session to have more than four people who had degrees. Right. And um, so 
I'm thinking, and here I'm a fifth generation officer, and I'm feeling like I really am going to help the world in this little town of Brushville, Indiana. And in one of the meetings, and we, I call him Joe. Uh, Joe comes to the altar and gives his heart to the Lord. So he says to me, he says, I want to learn more and more what it is to be like Jesus. I, I need to know. How do I do that, Lieutenant? I won't get into the whole Southern Indiana accent because all my accents end up sounding the same anyway. <laughs> but he said, I said, well, Joe, you need to read the Bible and get into it. And he looked at me seriously and said, well, Lieutenant, I, I, I can't read or write. I said, what? Well, how, how do you do business? He worked at a, um, he worked at, at, at a local factory and he would get a paycheck. I said, how do you sign your paycheck? He said, with an X. And someone then co-signed to say that this is me. Wow. And I'm trying to think, how do I do it? So I invited him to come over. I, I not even to come over. I said to him, when good for you? He said, well, at work, we get an extra half hour on Wednesdays. So I said, okay, then can we meet? Yeah. He said, we get an hour and 15 minutes. I think we could do something in an hour and 15 minutes. So yeah, I got gotcha. you. So I would go and read, and he was, well, he couldn't read or write. He was not dumb. He had street smarts. He had ability to fix things, which I still can't do. But here's Joe, and, and we're going through the Bible, John, and the Gospels, and a little bit of this. And he became a soldier, which meant we got him a uniform. And on the jacket, or were epaulets, what well, you had to sew them on. So we took off the red epaulets. He was a soldier. We put on blue epaulets. And he looked great in his uniform. Around two weeks after we got him in the uniform, he comes to church on Sunday morning, and his uniform is filthy. Dirt, dust, junk. I mean, he said, wow, Joe, you got to keep that clean. Yeah. He said, it's okay, Latina. I'll be fine. So we had our divisional commander coming. Major then, Robert Thompson, very dignified man. And I was wanting to impress him. And Joe had been doing this with this dirty uniform for three or four weeks. And I said, Joe, can we get your uniform? We'd like to get it clean for you. So we picked it up on Wednesday. On Saturday at 10 o'clock at night, we took it to him. Wow. So he would look good on Sunday morning. Basically, so I would look good. Wow. And so... I'm introducing people to really terrible building. That's another whole illustration, how God could use terrible places and still make them good. That's another one. But in, in this terrible building, we're at the front door, people coming in, hi, uh, Major, this is Gail, this is Barbara, this is Betty or whatever. And here comes Joe. And his uniform is filthy. And I was ready to kill him. I was that close. I mean, and, you know, I couldn't do that. I had to look good in front of the divisional commander. So I said, Joe, can I see you in my office? And, you know, one of the, I'm sure you know what I mean when I say that harsh whisper. I said, Joe, what is wrong with you? I said, nothing. I said, Joe, your uniform. He said, well, Lieutenant, I'm just doing what you said the Bible said. I said, Joe, the Bible never said, thou shalt make thy uniform dirtiest. We were still in King James back then. And so he said, no, but you told me it said we should help those who can't help themselves. And we should never take credit for it, right? So, yeah, so what? He said, I made an agreement with the lumber company, Metzger Lumber Company. And they would cut the law, the boards outside on a really just basically a hard dirt surface they get it to the size that people wanted and they gave him permission on sunday mornings at 6 30 in the morning to come and pick up those pieces and he would pick them up he would tie them off and he would take them to the lady down the street who was a widow who had a wood stove to heat her little trailer and he would put it on the porch and walk away. And he said, I wanted her, if she could, if she happened to see me, to see me in my Jesus suit. Wow. And so I said to Joe, 
let me have just a little bit of that holy dirt. Do you who couldn't read or write understood what true holy living was? And that has been one that has affected my ministry. Yeah. That was in my first year of ministry back in 1977. And I remember it like it was yesterday. Wow. So long before I was born. Long yes. before I was born. Well, <laughs> I won't say too long. <laughs> That's great. Oh, thanks, Dad, for sharing that. And uh, and I appreciate your time here today. And I think that that story particularly, but also the example that you gave and gave to me. And so we're trying to pass that along here to those in this class. Thanks so much, Dad. Love you. You're welcome. Love you. Have a good time. God bless. Okay. Hi, friends. I am here with my friend, Reverend Stan Key, who is a wonderful preacher. He's not just a camp meeting preacher, but he's spoken at Asbury University, a Wesley Biblical Seminary. He's been a pastor for many years in multiple countries and one of my favorites. So, Stan, welcome to the class and the podcast. <laughs> it's an honor. Love See, what I would have done it. if I could have had all these people that I'm having on here, I would have just brought them into a class and had a round table, but now we get to do it via Zoom. This is good. So we're talking about illustrations, and I would just love to hear how you think about developing illustrations and their importance to your preaching. You are asking a wonderful question, and it ought to be at the top of the list of every preacher of this right. question. How do I illustrate? This is not a side issue. This is, this is important. I think the first question, I've been thinking about this since you asked me yesterday to start thinking about it, is why do you use illustrations? Sure. Why? Sure. Uh, that's a theological question. Wow. Yeah. And there are several answers to that. You know, one, I think, is the greatest preacher who ever lived, a fellow named Jesus, <laughs> you know, Amen. drew word pictures magnificently. Yes. Uh, there was a man who had two sons. One was a good boy. One was a bad boy. One uh, went off and lived with pigs. Well, what has he done? He's just painted a picture. Yes. And uh, people remember pictures. And yeah. uh, But he's not, you don't tell an illustration to be cute. I've heard okay. preachers you tell a story because they're trying to be cute. They're trying to be trendy. Or they're trying to impress the audience by quoting wow. Blaise Pascal, and they don't have a clue who Blaise <laughs> Pascal is, or they're yeah. trying to impress with their knowledge. That is called carnality. That is Hello. called sin. That is called arrogance and pride. Wow. Do not use illustrations to impress people. There's been one or two times <laughs> I've had such a good story yeah. that I've told the story like at the beginning of a message. And then I've said, now that has nothing to do with what I'm about to say. <laughs> and, and which I think a story can be to build horizontal connection with your audience. Uh, right. in, in that sense, it can be cute, but don't tamper with the word of God. I mean, that's, that's too serious. So one, right. know why you're using illustrations. I think there's, two reasons um, pastorally yeah. to use illustrations. And one is, uh, this is just shooting from the hip. So I haven't Go for it. You know, thought about this. I've not tried to read about this. One is you're trying to illustrate biblical truth. So if you're preaching on the atonement, you right. know, well, you need some windows to help people understand what you're saying. And, and a good illustration that captures a doctrinal truth, uh, a biblical truth uh, is worth everything. Right. Uh, the other reason to use illustrations is because of your audience. Right. And so for example, in upstate New York where I preached for 18 years, if I would say, for example, Frodo. <laughs> well, Lord of the Rings. Yes, yes. And yes. tell a story about Frodo. Why am I doing that? 
that or if I said um, Derek Jeter, who plays ball for the New York Yankees, right? You know, at, at, when I was there, at least he played. Yeah. I'm using a that's a baseball illustration or a Lord of the Rings illustration, or if you said in a symphony orchestra, right? You know, why are there just four trumpets, but you know, 36 violins? Well, suddenly, what, what's going on when you do that? Well, when I would say Frodo, for example, in the pulpit, um, I would see teenage heads pop up. Sure. Did he say Frodo? Right, right. Did he say Frodo? You know, if I use a sports illustration, if you use a kitchen illustration, yes. you are connecting with certain elements of the congregation. Yes. And that's, that's crucial. Uh, I, uh, one day, and I used, when I was introducing communion, I was, I used the word limbus, which is the yeah, sure. way, way food, wayfarer's food in Lord of the Rings. Well, after church, uh, Rosemary, <laughs> a lady that just said, I can't believe you used the word limbus in communion because my son, yes, he said to me, did, did Pastor Stan say limbus? <laughs> and that's something to do with communion. Right. Well, she said, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. He connected with that one just little, now I think three-fourths of the congregation just rolled their eyes and said, there goes Stan again, talking yeah. about Lord of the Rings or something. Well, I don't care what they think. Right, I care right. About what John, uh, her son, thinks. Now you're so, connecting. And, and I also love you bring that into your book, which I had you on my podcast to talk about invitation to spiritual uh, journey to spiritual wholeness, the limbus bread there too. So you have something for that oh. bread. Secondly, I love how, and this has been a consistent theme that other preachers, some of them who will be on this that you know, have talked about the physical dimensions that while you're preaching, there is a, a physical response. Like I, I like to think of it, not that I've ever boxed, but there's a boxer. And as you move one direction, you make a counter move, right? In the other direction. And there's something about like reading the crowd that is not empirical, but it is definitely a reality. It's a, it's a mega reality. And people remember stories. I mean, yeah. I don't care how good your exposition of scripture is, and it'll drive you crazy because you'll spend five hours, you know, expository <laughs> preparing yeah. for a, a verse and then you'll tell one silly story and people will talk about it for 12 months i know <laughs> i don't know what to do with that but yeah if you're if the story illustrates the truth don't Amen. don't waste people's time don't tell stories to tell stories that is right. pastoral malpractice hello tell yeah. stories to illustrate a truth now, that's the other, I think that leads a pastor, at least somebody who preaches regularly, then you should always be looking for illustrations. Yes. Always, all, what, <laughs> if you're watching television, if you're taking a walk, when you're going to bed, if you're reading a story to your children at night, if you're, uh, you're always looking for illustrations. And because you're always like if next Sunday you're preaching on forgiveness, you know, you need a story or two, maybe to introduce it. An illustration can sometimes introduce scripture. Yeah. Just start off by telling, you know, last night I was reading Dr. Seuss to my child and yeah. you know, I read this story and suddenly you're telling a story, but then you're introducing forgiveness or, um, or as an illustration might close a sermon. That can right, be very right. effective. But the right illustration uh, is, is crucial. I, now, do you have a process for collating them? So you don't, because the problem that I found is like you have to get to a place where when you need them, you need them. And um, it's hard to remember, oh yeah, there was that, you know, my, my son did this. What, what's your process? That, that's, a, that's a great question, Andy. And you need a process. You yeah. need a process. For me, when I, I read, I read a lot. Yeah. When I read books, I write in the back of the book. Okay. I write in the back. And so I might write in the back of the book, great, great illustration on communist Russia to illustrate 
freedom in the midst sure. of oppression. You know, so on page 43. So sudden, so at, so that's, you may or may not that remember five years later, that book is on your shelf, but you might. Right. I think if I still use a file cabinet, I mean, as in a physical file cabinet, sure. most of your re, uh, class members probably only have computer files, but that works. But try putting just the topics like, um, what if you're illustrating peace in the midst right. of trials? Yeah. You know, just have a file called peace and yeah. put things in there as you read them, as you think about them. And then if you're preaching on peace 10 years from now, go back and look at that. My library, I mean, I really use it because I, when I put the high calling together, the magazine, yeah. it was always thematic driven. Right. So I've got a, uh, I've got files that says, oh, I remember now that yeah. illustration. I think you want to find personal illustrations. Yes. Yeah. People yeah. love children illustrations. You know, yeah. when my when I would tell a grandchild story, yeah. uh, people would just, if I Jaden, and I may tell one in just okay. a moment if you ask me for my favorite, but be authentic. I think your stories. Don't pretend, don't posture, don't try to be intellectual, don't be cute, be authentic. Your stories need to come out of who you are. Yeah. And, uh, and if, if it's sports or if it's music or if it's family, if it's a biological, biology illustration, yeah. you know, there, yeah. there's the world is full of pictures that give us windows into truth yeah and, and that's exactly uh, the textbook we use oh yeah. sorry to interrupt you no the, the textbook we use is by Ellsworth callus and his chapter on this uses the idea of windows like we're, yeah. we're trying to that's great and, and many of the things that you've said are exactly what the textbook says so you're in great you're in great company i wanted to mention do you have any this isn't something the textbooks address ethical pieces that you have in mind with, uh, with illustrations like uh, as far as even talking uh, uh, using an illustration of somebody in a congregation or your own children or um do you have uh using somebody else's illustrations how do you think through those difficulties just be candid be honest be humble um if don't plagiarize you know right. plagiarism is a, a tricky one because I think everything I preach that is good, I stole from somebody. <laughs> it's like, I, you can't not do that and you can't always give credit, uh, but it, it should be intuitive, you know, that if I'm using somebody else's outline right. as a sermon, I probably ought to say, you yes. know, I, the, the outline for what I'm preaching, I actually heard from a a John R. Stott sermon, you know, 40 yeah, sure, years sure. ago, it stuck with me. But if you're um, quoting something, you know, certainly give credit. Yeah. Um, I think I, th it, I think it's intuitive. Yeah. Don't pretend, don't abuse the pulpit. Yeah. Uh, and people do. I say that because I hear right. people quote things. Well, that's why I asked. And I also, yeah. I've also heard you, you use Dallas Willard brilliantly, actually. I'll say you're the one who helped me come back to Dallas Willard. I, I read him earlier in earlier in life or, you know, when I was in college and I probably didn't touch a Dallas Willard book for 15 years, but because of your use of him, particularly I'll have people go and find it. Your sermon on imputed righteousness um, at mm -hmm. Asbury university boy with the barcode, I'm just going to leave it open there for people. The, you, and you attributed that to him. Yeah. And it didn't discount, this, just the fact that you didn't yeah. come up with that idea didn't discount its applicability to me. Okay, I'm, I don't have too long. So Stan, give us, a, if you have a, a, a top illustration, tell us one of your good illustrations, your go-tos. Yeah, uh, you will find if you preach for years that there are certain illustrations that uh, are just, and, and hopefully you'll say they're mine. They're Amen. my, it's, it, this is, this is me. Uh, maybe my 
I don't know which is my favorite, but this okay. is near the top. And I've ended up using this on Easter Sunday morning. I began, right. I, be, I began, and I really felt the Lord gave me this. Uh, so this is Easter Sunday. And I stood up and said something like, my grandson, Jaden, who was at the time around three years old, and I went for a one day camping trip in Vermont. There's more. So we were living in upstate New York at the time, and we were driving through, driving to the campsite to meet other people. He's in the back seat in his car seat, just the two of us in the car through this idyllic Vermont countryside. When from the back seat, I heard Jaden say, Papa, I just saw a camel. <laughs> and I said, Vermont. <laughs> Jaden, there are no camels in Vermont. I, and I'm in my mind, I was angry at him because it's like, yeah. don't you know your animals by now? We spent all <laughs> these money on books. This is Easter Sunday morning. I'm telling sure. this much better than I'm telling it right now. But uh, so I, I, I said, it must have been a llama or maybe, a, maybe even a cow. I said, there are llamas, but there's no camel. You know, just a mental picture of a camel in Vermont is, is discordant. And so uh, I said, Jaden, there's no camels in Vermont. And then all I heard from the back seat was it had two humps. So I said, oh my goodness, this poor child is, doesn't know his answer. So I said, tell you what, tomorrow we're going to drive back on the same road and we'll find your camel. Well, the next day we drove back and I said, okay, Cam, Jaden, we're getting close. Let's look for your cam. I thought in my mind, it's got to be a llama. Sure. Or it's maybe even a billboard. I said it. Oh, interesting. But there's no camels in Vermont. It's, we're in the country. You know, it's like mountains, the white mountains, gorgeous scenery. There's no cam. Well, we got to this field and it was full of sheep. I said, are we close? He said, we're close. And I'm. Um, and then I looked off in the field, and there was a, next to the haystack a, a two humped, long haired Mongolian camel. <laughs> so I, I uh, just said, Jaden, Papa is so sorry. And then I said, So why am I telling you this story? I said, Well, when Mary came back from the tomb, mm. she said, Jesus is risen. Amen. And the disciples all said, Mary, there's no camels in Vermont. <laughs> Dead Amen. bodies don't rise from the tomb. Amen. I don't know if that works for you right now, but on that Easter Sunday morning, it set it up. I said, there are, I said, I should have checked Jaden's reference. Jaden knew exactly what a camel was. Wow. And, uh, it was Papa who was the idiot. <laughs> Papa was the idiot. And when Mary came and said, he's alive, you know, nobody believed the women there. Mm -hmm. And well, uh, people talked about that illustration for years. Wow. And, and they went and Googled it. And there really is this mo long haired Mongolian <laughs> camel one in Vermont. There it is. That oh, may be. beautiful. But that uh, was, I love it. The way you tell the, the tell the illustration, it brings us in and we're skeptical too. I mean, exactly. my mind's immediate. And that's what makes it work. Like yeah. I enter into it with you because my kids have said, now my kids have probably made up some camels uh, when they're driven, <laughs> but my mind's there with you. So, oh, Stan, I wish I had longer. Thanks so much for visiting our class and and this podcast too. You're a blessing, and I, I hope you have many opportunities to preach and develop more illustrations. There's never been a greater day for preaching, and there's never been a greater dearth of good preachers. Mm. And preaching the word is is what it's about, and. You need just windows to get people not into going away saying, what a great preacher you were. Amen. But right. wow, that's the word of God. That's Amen. what you want him to do. Thanks, Andy. Thanks for your time. God bless you. Yeah.